right, fantastic. Next up, we have Chris Walker talking about informed consent and informing patients about risks versus benefits. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Looks like I'm still on the old slides. Yeah, that monitor is, yeah, your slides are up there. Okay. So I have no relevant financial disclosures, a few non-relevant disclosures that are listed. So I wanted to start off by looking at a few cases just to assess everyone's knowledge about radiation from common exams that we perform. So take a look at this first case. This exam is equivalent to how many days of normal background radiation? One day, 10 days, 100 days, or 1,000 days? And each one of these cases will also have a specific diagnosis associated with it. So take a look, see if you can actually see the diagnosis. So this is a chest radiograph, which is equivalent to 0.1 millisieverts of dose. And that's about 10 days of normal background radiation therapy. You can also see a nice example of a bronchial atresia. And so you can see this branching tubular shaped opacity representing the atretic bronchus filled with mucus and then distal air trapping in the left upper lobe. So second case, so this exam is equivalent to how many years of normal background radiation? One year, two years, four years, or six years? And again, try to think of the actual diagnosis for this case. And so this is a chest CT, which has a dose of around 6.1 millisieverts which for normal background radiation, that's about two years of dose. And a, another congenital lesion, this is an intralobar sequestration. So you can see this large feeding artery arising from the descending thoracic aorta, supplying this area of sequestered lung. So the radiation dose by different exams is gonna vary depending on the body part that we're imaging, who we're actually imaging, so what is the age of the patient, and the type of study. So three different studies here. You can see the effective dose, which is in millisieverts. And then what is the correlate in either months or years for the amount of radiation given for each of these studies? And so today I'm gonna to be discussing radiation, some of the risks associated with radiation, it's linked to cancer. I'll briefly discuss some of the risks associated with lung cancer screening. And due to the interest of time, I'm not gonna discuss informed consent related to imaging guided procedures. So before we get into the specifics, how do we do as a profession in relation to radiation and understanding radiation associated with imaging? So this was a study that looked at 39 final year medical students out of Norway. So despite having imaging and radiation in their curriculum, they scored very low on this exam. So the majority underestimated doses for imaging studies and their knowledge of radiation and the risks of imaging were pretty low you would think attendings would do better. And so this study looked at 158 physicians uh, that were tested on various factors related to radiation from imaging. It included 25 radiologists, 133 non-radiologists. The biggest take home for me was a third of the non-radiologists could not actually differentiate exams that had ionizing radiation, like a radiograph or a chest CT, from those that did not have radiation, so an MRI or an ultrasound. In the rest of them, so the majority of the non-radiologists actually underestimated the dose associated with these exams. Radiologists thankfully did quite a bit better, but only a third were able to correctly say how much dose a chest radiograph has. So these studies have been repeated with multiple different groups. This was a study that included CT technologists, and when they asked 24 technologists this question, a pregnant woman underwent a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast as her pregnancy status was not inquired by the technologist before performing the CT. What should be the course of action according to the ACR guidelines? A, reassurance, risk to fetus is negligible. B, suggest medical termination. C, do genetic analysis. Or D, do MRI of the fetus to look for anomalies. And of those 24 technologists, so these are CT technologists that were surveyed, only 13% answered correctly, A, reassurance, the risk to the fetus is negligible. Surprisingly, a decent number of them actually chose medical termination as the option. 
And when you think about this, the technologists are probably going to be the people that most commonly answer these questions to patients that come in for imaging procedures. So what are we doing wrong as a profession? So why is this so confusing? I think some of the reason is you have all of these different terms. So you probably heard about several of these, gray, sievert, rem, rad. We have absorbed dose, effective dose, equivalent dose. And even me, kind of 10 years out of training, I have a hard time kind of keeping all of these different terms straight in my mind. And so I think this is part of the reason why it's so confusing. When we think about imaging and how we actually interpret images from ionizing radiation, so the images from a radiograph or a CT are formed by these x-rays or radiation that passes through the body. Some of that radiation that we use to make the images is going to be absorbed by the body, and this contributes to the dose to the actual patient. When we look at whole body dose, we use the term effective dose, which is given as a millisievert. And we use effective dose to talk about future cancer risk, knowing that there are certain tissue types, like developing breast tissue or any of the tissues in young children, that are going to be more susceptible to radiation damage than other tissue types. Just living on planet Earth, we are all exposed to naturally occurring radiation. So the average person in the United States receives about three millisieverts of non-medical radiation annually. And this comes in the form of cosmic radiation from outer space, as well as radiation exposure to things in the atmosphere like radon. We also know that those living at higher altitudes are going to be exposed to more radiation. So people living in Denver will have more radiation than someone living in Kansas City. There are multiple different factors that are going to affect the dose that a patient receives from an imaging study. What is their height and weight? How old is the patient? Patients that are younger are going to have a greater risk of radiation-inducing damage than older patients. What body part are we actually imaging? Are we imaging the brain, which doesn't tend to be affected by radiation as much as developing breast tissue? What protocol are we using for the CT? Are we using a lower KEV? Are we doing dose modulation with the MAS? So all of these factors will contribute to the actual dose. So when you're looking at a chest CT, most of you will have, have access to a dose report state, uh, page. And usually dose is going to re be reported in a few different fashions. So you'll see a computed tomography dose index or a CTDI. You may see a dose length product, which is expressed in milligrams per centimeter. One easy way to to convert the DLP to the effective dose in millisieverts is by a multiplying factor. So each body part, depending on the age of the patient, will have a different conversion factor. So in the chest, the conversion factor is 0.014 for adults. So if you had a dose of 500 DLP in an adult for a chest CT, you would multiply 500 by the 0.014 to get a dose of seven millisieverts. So what do patients want to know about their imaging? Well, not surprisingly, patients want to know why they're having the test, what is the test going to do, and how will it actually improve their care? And I think for the most part, providers do this with their patients. So most providers will explain why they're having the test. However, when they surveyed 147 patients, 95% of, of the patients expected information on radiation dose in the risks of imaging. What do parents want to know in regards to radiation? So this was a survey of 41 parents who came into a radiology department, and they surveyed them on information that the referrer provided to them prior to their child undergoing the test. And thankfully, most of the providers explained why they were having the test, why they were performing the test, but only 7% talked about radiation dose with the parents. And of those parents, 88% wanted more information on radiation dose. And so we're obviously not doing a great job of providing this to the public. However, we have these headlines in the public that basically link radiation from imaging procedures to cancer. CT scans in children linked to cancer later. Radiation from CT scans linked to cancers and deaths, causing 29,000 new cancers each year, 14,500 deaths each year. We know that imaging utilization is increasing year over year. There was a seven-fold increase in medical radiation exposure from the 1980s to 2009. It's also believed that 
imaging radiation has a stochastic effect, meaning that there's no minimal threshold dose that may not cause damage. And so when this radiation gets absorbed by the patients, it may result in DNA damage. The body does a great job to try to heal that DNA damage, but occasionally that healing may be incomplete, leading to a mutation that may take years or even decades to manifest as a malignancy. All of our data from the risks of imaging radiation leading to cancer is extrapolated from atomic bomb survivors. So it was these patients in World War II that were somewhat near the atomic bombs that received a dose of around less than 50 millisieverts. And so remember, a standard chest CT is about six millisieverts. And so all of these patients received all of their dose at one time, whereas 10 to 12 chest CTs may uh, end up causing the same amount of radiation. And so the fact is that we do not really have data that low-level ionizing radiation from imaging, that it actually leads to cancers, but it's all based off of this extrapolated data from atomic bomb survivors. So what do they estimate the risk of inducing a fatal cancer per imaging study? And so this is one kind of list of various risks associated with different studies. So you can see the chest radiograph often has a very low dose. So the risk of inducing a fatal cancer is going to be one in a million to one in a hundred thousand. A whole body PET CT has quite a bit more radiation. So the estimated risk is one in a thousand to one in 500. For the last few minutes, I just want to talk briefly about lung cancer screening and some of the risks associated with lung cancer screening. Before a Medicare patient is able to undergo screening, they must participate in a shared decision-making visit with a provider. And so during this visit, they're going to assess multiple things, whether or not the patient is actually eligible for screening, so their current or past tobacco use. They'll talk about the benefits and harms to lung cancer screening. If they're a smoker, they'll discuss tobacco cessation counseling. And then also one of the important things that seems to fall through the cracks more more often every year is can and will the patient actually undergo therapy if a cancer is found? Are they so debilitated that because of their comorbidities, they're not able to receive radiation or have a surgery for lung cancer? Or are they under the mindset, if I find a cancer, I actually don't want to do anything? And not surprisingly, I come across this probably on a once every six month period where we'll image patients with screening that actually don't want any treatment once they're found to have a lung cancer. The biggest benefit of screening with low-dose CT is we're gonna find a cancer at an early enough stage that it can be cured with either surgery or radiation therapy. There are, there are several risks associated with lung cancer screening. And so one of the risks are these false positive results uh, that may induce excess patient anxiety. So these are these infectious or inflammatory nodules that look all the world like a cancer, but end up being benign. Frequently, we will find incidental findings on screening. And so we may come across an indeterminate renal lesion or a thyroid lesion that leads to further workup, further patient anxiety to prove that it isn't a cancer. We all, we're all human, and so we will miss cancers, even though they're present on the CT scan. Maybe they're a very difficult to see cancer because it's via vessel. Maybe we got interrupted during the scan from a call and we forgot to go back to that same area. And then the last point I want to touch on is overdiagnosis. And so overdiagnosis refers to cancers that are true cancers but would have never caused patient symptoms and would have not resulted in the patient's death. And so when we think about overdiagnosis, we often think about this with prostate cancer or certain forms of breast cancer like DCIS, but people don't usually think about it with lung cancer. Increasingly, we're finding that we probably are overdiagnosing some of these cancers in patients with lung cancer because they often have a lot of competing causes of death because of their smoking. They may re that may result in a myocardial infarction resulting in death before an aggressive cancer. Or more commonly refers to these lower grade or minimally invasive adenocarcinomas or adenocarcinoma in situ that tend to grow very, very slowly. And so the risk here is that we're over-treating some of these patients that would never have, been able, never have needed to undergo therapy. The predicted range in the literature is all over the map. So we have some studies predicting about 10% of lung cancers diagnosed with lung cancer screening are overdiagnosed, all the way up to the highest I saw was 49%. 
I think lung rads has done a great job at limiting the amount of overdiagnosis. So I think the number is closer to 10%, but it's definitely present. So in summary, the effective radiation dose is dependent on many different factors. What body part is imaged, what's the size of the patient, how old is the patient, and the parameters we use during the scan. The estimated risk of fatal cancer from ionizing radiation related to imaging is extrapolated data from atomic bomb survivors. And then finally, remember overdiagnosis is gonna to refer to cancers that are found that would have never impacted a patient's life. Thank you.